everybody, Fixer here, back with Firewatch on the audio tour. We're heading back to the actual plume of smoke that I completely forgot about last time, or, or got lost track of, whatever. Anyways, so we're heading over there, and I want to report it. Okay, I have eyes on that smoke plume. Great. Find your way over there and give them hell. Right. And I am going the right way now, right? I go over here and I make a, a lefty... Lucy? I believe after I go down this shale site, if I remember correctly, right? Have I done this one? I've done this one. Um, There's nothing here right now. Check your map. I have not done that one. Apparently. Why is there no rope on here? Well, I'm back at my shitty boss is gonna get me killed hill. You ready to give it another shot? Ugh. Do I seriously have to? To get down to Five Mile Creek? Yeah, afraid so. It's quite a ways downhill from here. Ugh. Yeah, so it feels like my game may be a little bit buggy, because obviously I've I you can't get this far in the game without going down this shale slide here. So I feel like my game may be a little bit bugged out there. Perhaps. And then there should be one to the left here. I believe this is the one I need to go to. Or no. Story of ropes, climbing, physics, and change. I don't think I did this one. What? Hi, this is Will. And this is James again. We're talking about the rope right now. Uh, you should have... You should be one nearby. Yeah, the rope was... Um... The very, very first thing I ever did in the entire game, it kind of seeped into being quite an important part of the world layout. We sort of had this whole uh, Metroidvania items thing, and the rope was very much our first, like, you know, that's the rockets that let you get through the door in Metroid. It was such an early flag we planted in the ground for ourselves. So, yeah, there were lots of technical things, well, weren't there? All the rope climbs are different, all the rope slides are different. Uh, minorly different, but different enough. Uh, so the rope had to be physically simulated. It couldn't be just a pre-canned animation. Uh, in order to get that to work, took a ton of time, lots of iterations. Uh, in the end, I had to basically make Henry's hand a gravity well whenever he's on the rope, and then grab the nearest parts of the rope and reskin them to uh, bones that I was just making out of math around Henry's hand and belt. So his like, left hand, right hand, and belt are all take over as fake bones and we reskin the rope every frame to get that to match up perfectly and if you look real close at the rope you can see sort of a little bit in front of his hands the texture on it the tiling changes and kind of squishes and stretches and squishes and stretches as you go down uh, and that's because the rope position doesn't naturally always like line up with even spacing when I swap in those fake bones yeah, the, the rope is one of the best examples if you were to like zoom the camera out and look at uh, what's going on where like I'm sort of animating by the seat of my pants and like just keeping his hands in the perfect position so that that transition between the physics rope and the skinning version of the rope, you know, doesn't uh, blend too strangely and um, it's probably the the set of animations in the game that has the most versions made. There's probably like 10 different versions of climbing down. There used to be things where your hands would swap in front of you, you know, picking the rope from one to the other, and obviously that is unbelievably, ridiculously complicated once we had a physical rope. And nice thing is you can get on it from anywhere and at any time and it all works, so it was it was worth it in the end, but quite a bit of quite a bit of effort. Did that one appear because I don't remember listening to that one. It's it's been it's been quite a few days since I've played this, but I don't remember that one at all. Atmospheric effects, light haze, and color. This is a pretty area. Hi, this is uh, Ben again, and I'm here with Paolo. Hello. 
We're going to talk about stylistic fog and some of the other effects in the game. For the stylistic fog, we basically use the same approach that we used for um, the other rendering components and technologies of Firewatch, which was how do we get something that allows Ollie and Jane to really just be directive and paint colors and information like they want into a 3D world. So the only challenge that was there really was how do we translate sort of a, a 3D scene that has depth into it into layers of colors and immediately we came up with this technique of using a one-dimensional texture that is applied you can imagine uh, imagine that the image it's a um, it's a sort of a rectangular image goes from left to right imagine that left is the color that is closer to the player and right is the color that is in the distance so in that way you are basically able to paint color in the depth of the world and that really gave jane and ollie the control they needed to make the firewatch colors as, as beautiful and, as they are yeah it really matches a lot of ollie's original like poster and previs work for the game yeah and that technique is used a lot in like film in film they wouldn't even just use one texture sometimes they'll use like hundreds of these strips to to layer out an entire scene but can't do that in a video game because we got to render it a lot of frames per second on bad computers sometimes yeah yeah and uh, for that like for the color correction specifically we used the uh the plugin that was actually available in the unity asset store and it just worked right off the bat for us it gave us sort of the real-time uh tweaking that we needed and thanks to that we saved some development time which was really precious yeah, that was the uh, Amplify Color, if you're really yeah, wanting right. to make your own Firewatch. Uh, and in an area like this Aspen Grove, you can see all those effects coming together. You see we have God rays coming from the sun. We have depth of field. Um, if you pick up an object to blur out the world, you can see all the different colors that Ollie's manipulating beyond just like what the sky and light would provide. Yeah, awesome. Now this turtle here, I don't believe I picked up this one in the first playthrough. Whoa, I, uh, I found a turtle. Maybe it's a, a tortoise. It's a thing with a shell. Well, isn't that something? It's actually pretty cute. Well, Henry, if you decide you want it to keep you company, nobody will mind. Now, what do I call it? Looks like a, uh, hmm. Uh, oh, this ought to be good. Shelly Duvall. Ah, Shelly. I see what you did there. Very nice. She's, uh, she's dainty, yet powerful. Well, I loved her in The Shining. Let's keep that. Oh, I got an achievement for that. How wonderful. Is there another one here? It's a little ways away still. Boy, for as dry as it is this summer, there's an area down here that's uh, lush. Oh, you must be talking about the Aspen Grove down there. Yeah, I think that's where I am. Those trees are actually one root organism. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah, they share their water as a colony that can live for hundreds of years, even through fire. This is the sort of biome-based small talk that will be invaluable to you as a single man. Also, uh, by what it looks like on this map, you'll be coming up on a stream that should lead you towards where we saw that smoke. Alright, it's not here. It's this way. We're getting towards the end of the chapter. There we are. Oh, what's that? He's not supposed to be there. Hi, this is Ollie again. And this is Syndra. I worked as a character artist. One of the most important things about this game, from our point of view, was to try and get the player to kind of inhabit this character, Henry. And a big part of that was his character design. Um, we wanted him to be a little different to the regular kind of character you might expect from this kind of game. Um, he's a little older, a little more portly, and uh, we wanted to make sure that, you know, when you look down, you can see your body and you really, like, feel as if you are playing this character. Um, and to do that, I designed him from the point of view of, like, trying to make him feel like an older man in terms of the way he moved and looked. We used a lot of, um, I guess, reference for this, particularly uh, comedian Louis C.K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, had like back a, to I had, like, a mood board uh, that I made that's just, essentially just, like, a collage of, yeah, Louis C.K., and there was also a fair bit of, like, uh, Wreck-It Ralph and, like, the heavy from Team Fortress. Sort of, like, these, sort of, like, these heavy, uh, sort of slow-moving characters. So, actually, when I was modeling, uh, I would actually put, like, a camera in Henry's head so I could look down 
at his body, which is like, <laughs> I think most of the design characters for third person games and mobile and stuff like that, I was not used to, you know, designing anything from that perspective. The initial model I sent you guys was pretty much just a bunch of primitives uh, mashed together, like really rough, sort of like, you know, early, early Dreamcast 3D kind of looking stuff, uh, just to get like a feel for the you know, just proportions and to give James something to rig so you could just get something moving and kind of get a preview of the motions because, you know, you don't need like a fully formed, highly detailed 3D model to just do animation. Uh, so actually nailing that stuff on early on was really important, I think. One of the biggest focuses was the hands because those are the things that the player sees the most and they're the most sort of expressive, mm. Henry. So we wanted to make sure that the shapes were really um, simple and bold and evocative in order to allow James, our animator, kind of give him the best material to work with and portray the character through, the, through those motions. Yeah, they're, they're practically the main character. Cool! Let's get some good shots of Henry, why don't we? There you go. That would be a great thumbnail, right? Perfect. So that's pretty funny that he's a combination of Louis C.K., uh, the T of Two Heavy, and Wreck-It Ralph. I find that funny. Pretty cool. And we're going to come up to the tent. Not missing anything, right? Number 26. I'll just skip by all that stuff. There's a lot of dialogue in there. What's this? Who wrecked the camp? Well, it was, um... It was Ned. Hey, it's Sean. And Chris. Hey, Sean. So we are at the teens camp that has been destroyed, ransacked, rummaged, torn apart. Yeah. And I know you had some confusion over this, Chris. I did. I didn't realize I had confusion. So I was the person who did all the gameplay wiring logic hookup stuff for this scene. And the entire time I was doing it, I, for some reason, was under the mistaken impression that it was a bear that destroyed this camp. I, for some reason, had convinced myself that, oh, Goodwin was sort of involved in framing Henry for teen stuff, but also, just separately and coincidentally, a bear just, like, blasted through here and tore up the tent. And I think I didn't realize until the game was almost done that that was not the case. And I think that's one of the challenges is of making a game like this and where we're telling a story that doesn't explicitly call out why everything is happening. I think me personally, and I think you agree with me, Chris, because we talk about movies and stories a lot, is we I really find it obnoxious when a story goes out of its way to explain everything and handhold you through the plot of the story. Uh, ultimately, you, the player, may have thought it doesn't really matter to you whether it was a good one or a bear because it's, it's doing all the things on an emotional level that it needs to do as a scene, which is stress you out, realize there's danger, and create the fact that the teens feel like it was you. Like, you just know it's not you, so that's right. what works here. Um, like or as you written, may have correctly intuited what happened, and that's also good. Yeah, Goodwin sets out to cause you distress and frame you for acts of violence such as this. By inflaming the already existing tension between you and these teens. Exactly right. Uh, because he just wants you out of here. Uh, you entered that cave on your first day, and he knows what's in the bottom of it, and uh, sort of doesn't want you to. Yeah, trips a, a trigger for him. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. All right. Word. We knew that. Uh, looks like someone left a note. Intriguing. You got a dialogue to get to the it. next area. Okay. Yeah. Let me know what it says. I guess I got to do that then. Whoa, their tent is demolished. You're there. Where are they? I, I don't know. Gone. This whole place is torn apart. What happened? Um, I don't remember what I said. Looks like it could have been better. Maybe they had a fight. I have no idea. It's pretty bad. Well, just look around. Make sure they weren't, you know, injured or... Uh, murdered? <sighs> they weren't murdered. Oh, do you remember when I came out here to quietly look for fires? They weren't. Just... Oh, they're gone, for sure. Well, what's it say? Uh, there you go. I'm threatening to call the police because they think I attacked them. Oh my god, well, did you? No. no well, hey, I didn't do this. Okay, someone or something went to town here, but it wasn't me. Because I told you to scare them, not assault them. 
I didn't. Of course I didn't. I just threw their stereo in the lake. Yeah, <laughs> I really wish you wouldn't have done that. This is, I don't know, weird as hell, but it wasn't me. It's, it's okay. I believe you. Weird stuff happens in the woods. It could be other campers. They could be having a bad mushroom trip. We really don't know. But or Nick. They're gone. There's no way to call the cops. They're not coming back. And we can get to work. I'd really like to start enjoying a quiet summer. Yeah, me too. Well, you're in for a treat. And it's day three. Let's see what we got going here. Does it feel like those loading times are a little longer than they were the first time? Find boards! Um, is there a... Alright, this one's open now. Picking up objects. Did I do this one? It's label number three. Hey, Henry. What? Yeah. Um, what do you look like? Why are you asking? Because I'm horribly superficial. Um, I don't remember what... Oh, I said Raleigh Fingers. Do you know Raleigh Fingers? He pitched for the A's? No. Well, I'm the spitting image of him. Oh, wait, is he the guy with the snidely whiplash thing going on from, from the 70s? <gasps> oh, my dad loved him. <laughs> yeah, that's him. That mustache. Mm. Now you have my attention. Rawr. Okay. She's so crazy. Okay, well, that gives me a good start. Now let's see. In my scope, I can only tell you're a white guy wearing shorts. It's hot. And maybe, by the way, I'm not white. It's not very, uh, you know, PC or whatever they say. Oh my god, you are the whitest man. <laughs> I don't need a spotting scope for that. And if not shorts, then what do you normally like to wear? Um, I don't remember. Clothes. I don't really think about it. Oh, come on. I got a sweatshirt I like. Good jacket I got at the Buckle Barn. Ooh, I love the Buckle Barn. Just one of those brown ones, you know. I do. Now tell me about your face. I'm looking at you across the bar. What do I see? Uh... <laughs> End the conversation, Henry! Maybe I don't see anything. Let's see what happens. Um, and we do got to pick up the boards. It's not easy. Ignore her. Fine. Forget it. One <laughs> last one. <laughs> okay. I want to know about your eyes. Don't I'm answer. I'm drawing you. I need to know. Your what? Is, is that okay? Uh. Don't, <laughs> don't answer. I'm going to do it regardless. Fine. Your eyes. Tell me. They're, uh, they're steely cold hard stare mm, like a Siberian husky <laughs> uh, sure okay got it thank you Henry you get what you need hey this is Will and this is James we actually spend a lot of time trying to get the physicality of Firewatch nailed down and one of the big parts of that was getting objects in your hand like feeling like you could pick things up and touch them it turned out to be quite a bit of work though you know nothing that was like reinventing the wheel it was just a matter of getting you know, very specific offsets and very specific grips for every single item in the game, nearly. We had tons and tons of concepts and we were looking at all sorts of games and like Far Cry 2 and things for like, where's the best uh, example of grabbing something in the world and it isn't just floating in front of you in the sort of Half-Life 2 style. We ended up just basically popping it into your uh, hand over one frame, but making sure that happens at the exact moment that your hand's swiping over it. and. It's worked surprisingly well. There were sorts of strange things as well, though, like these giant hands, and then like you'd put a beer can in his hand and suddenly be like, oh, right, yeah, it looks like a little miniature minibar, you know, <laughs> airplane kind of Coke. And so there are all kinds of strange little things that cropped up, but um, actually having the objects in your hands and you could turn them around from any angle, it ended up making it worth doing all these super detailed props so like Ollie would make the fireworks and do just really funny cool designs that you could only actually see if you turned them around and looked at them really closely and uh, I think it paid off basically. And those are just like a couple of poses that we blend between, those aren't even very complicated, the lookovers, right? Yeah, not at all really, there's basically one for books and there's one for everything else and it's just 
pretty much two points, like fully to the left and fully to the right, with just like a sort of intelligent blend between those two things. So um, there were so many items in the game, we couldn't have authored individual examines for them all. But even that was ended up being incredibly hard to tune to get just right. Like, again, lots of iteration. <laughs> well, it seems to work fine. I think it did. It's Ollie again. Oh, it's Jake. I realized uh, sort of halfway through development that the player has a kind of neb has a quite a sort of nebulous idea of what Henry looks like, and that would be a fun thing to play with by getting the player to describe themselves to Delilah, and then having those answers feed into a drawing that we, you would then find in Delilah's tower at the end of the game. I think actually even one step back behind that, you had done a, a sketch really really early on of the inside of Delilah's tower that just had a drawing of Henry's face and said Henry and pointed at his tower, and I think that was oh, the, right. that was the inspiration. <laughs> yeah, maybe just was... maybe maybe Delilah, I just. Like, I thought that moment already was really cool, that mm. you'd get to Delilah's tower and see that she'd drawn what she thinks you look like and an arrow pointing at your lookout tower. But right. in that sketch, it was Henry's face, and we're like, how would... I think yeah. you said, yeah, how, uh, oh, this doesn't make any sense because she would not draw an on-model perfect Henry. Right. Um, and then Sean took the Delilah draws Henry idea and ran with it and made it the conversation for day three. Mm -hmm. um, because I think day three's initial design was, you nail up some boards. Nels and I had to actually build the end result from all the sketches you did of the different of the different faces, shirts, and well, mustaches. Well, originally it was, it was going to be I was just going to draw the, uh, <laughs> individual drawings for each. For each yeah, version. it ended up being well over a thousand, maybe thousands and thousands of variants that would have had to be <laughs> so drawn. So to come up with a smart Yeah, we, we had to do something smarter, so we broke it all down mm -hmm. into pieces. And that piece of paper that you find in Delilah's Tower is actually, I think, being like put together from pieces in real time for each player like there is there's no texture mm -hmm. that has any one of those things uh, yeah. and, and it allowed us to do a somewhat sort of shonky uh, Delilah drawing which, which I think is quite funny and unexpected given that I love that I no, love I that like Delilah it. is bad at drawing it's a game Especially, it's well, a game full of everyone who can draw because you drew all of it so it's good that Delilah just draws just yeah just draws bad drawing <laughs> I feel like, like, look at it, like, ha like all the the stations are gone now. It's almost like when a day goes by, it, like, I don't want to say it resets, but, it, like, all the stations you were supposed to look at, it just disappear. So I don't know. I hope I didn't miss any. Hi, this is Jane again. And Chris. And we are right by the outhouse. And this is also where we decided to put the generator that Henry has to use for Just power. to make it as annoying as possible for him <laughs> when he's using the facilities. So normally I think the generator is not usually by the outhouse. Usually it's actually under the tower where it would be you know, more convenient. But we decided to put it there because um, it's usually more interesting for gameplay if you sort of cluster a few objects of interest together so it's not just super spread out. It ended up being a real challenge for audio because most of the time when you're in the tower you don't want to hear the generator because it would just get annoying and repetitive but there were certain times like mm -hmm. when you first arrive at the tower and you flip the power switch on and the generator goes on you want the player to hear the generator so it needs to be much louder but then you don't want them to like walk down the stairs and the generator is incredibly loud <laughs> so I had to do all this weird cheating basically to cheat the level of the generator audio volume depending yeah. on what the game needs it to be. Yeah. Also, funny story about the generator. So you found yes. this like classic generator model. I think it's called a Genero. Generis, I think. Yeah, it's it's something like that. Basically, I based it off of this real generator, but you know, to not infringe on anyone's brand name, I just changed it a little bit and I was like, ha ha ha. Funny, I would just call it generic. And then we actually heard from someone we know who <laughs> works for the real generator company. Uh, he was telling us that he, when he saw that in the game, it cracked him up because at the that actual company, when they're like frustrated <laughs> at their own product, if something is like not doing its job, they actually call it generic generator. <laughs> they managed to we nailed it like completely nail the insider terminology for this classic generator. Peachy. All right. Well, um, I gotta okay. trigger the I next think day. I'm ready to tackle my long-term commitment of keeping this national forest safe from total destruction. I am glad to hear you've really thought this through. Oh, look at that frame rate drop! Holy cow! Of course. We've issued you a comfy chair to sit in and everything. You know, it's not really that comfy. 
I mean, it's wooden and there's no padding. I think I actually got a splinter in my thigh this morning. Aww. Well, regardless, take a seat. The forest depends on you. Day nine. I think we're eating a sandwich here. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong. There we go. Interesting. It's got the. Hello, Henry. It's right next Having to a, a stand. Nice afternoon? I want to read that. Not too bad. I could get used to it out here. That's nice. Look, um, I called with bad news. Two young women, Chelsea Stevens and Lily McLean, were reported missing. They've got parents out in California who haven't heard from them in a week. They were supposed to meet an aunt down in Cody. If they're the girls from last week, then you're probably the last person to have seen them. I don't remember this rope being here. I'm pretty sure you couldn't climb down this thing before. So I'm putting a rope down there so I can get... Well, it's a big if. It might not be them. Look, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, I mean, if, if they turn up dead, then maybe. <laughs> Should I just not say anything and save us the trouble? I'm pretty sure this, this fast forward is meaner the next day. We'll see. Yeah, don't. Oops, wrong button. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. All right, Henry, thanks. Enjoy the sunset. Oh, cool. So it doesn't do it. I'm glad they fixed that. Oh, it doesn't. Never mind. They didn't fix that. So I got to go back there sometime and, and grab that somehow. I think. Henry. Henry, wake up. What's going on? What the hell is that? Get out of bed and oh! pick up the radio. <laughs> oh, Forrest. You woke me up. There you go. That's interesting that it actually interfered. Come on, Forrest. For Pete's sake. Is this different? Julia. It is! It's completely different. Oh wow, what happened to my light? Alright. So this automatically will forward me to the next day by triggering that. So I'm going to do this first. Hi, Larissa. Hi. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Well, I think you probably know this, but in the original script, your character was not Australian. She was from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then you were cast, and I changed the entire script. Hooray yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't actually know that she was from Chicago, but I did know that she was originally American, but then... When we discussed it, you know, you, you had that thought of, well, why couldn't she be from anywhere as, uh, you know, the world becomes more multicultural? And therefore, since I am Australian natively anyway, to just, uh, you know, capitalize on that. It was like a beautiful discovery. It was <laughs> so serendipitous because it would have been really easy, I feel like, even though you and Sissy sound so different, like right. You have different tones of voice. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would have been easy had you had an American accent for people to a little bit be confused. It's a really startling scene, this scene that we're in here, where the radio chirps yeah. and it's his wife and not his boss. Her. Yeah. Yeah. I, and we, we I've wanted actually, it to... I was going to say, I've watched a, a bit of a gameplay with people in that moment playing the game and their commentary on it. And it's always really fun to have that. What? Yeah. Uh, who is oh. that? Who is that? Is that? Is that? You know, it's kind of like That's having exactly that moment what I of did. going so unfamiliar to kind of jut in with this with this different sound when everyone's expecting it to be sissy. So That's yeah, and I don't. I I really don't believe you would have gotten that with such a potent like pop had right. we had it not been the accent. And to the point where I think had you had um, an American accent, I would have asked you to do one. <laughs> had I had, <laughs> but I wouldn't have had the idea had I not been presented with you as an actor. Um, to do that. Yeah, I just, well, it never even occurred to me for that to be the case until it was like, well, she's the best woman for the job, and oh, she also happens to be Australian. Oh, wait, why isn't Julia Australian? Wait, that's yay. so much better across the board. Why wasn't she Australian <laughs> to begin with? I am bad at my job. <laughs> no, it worked. It worked. Um, Let's trigger that. What do you want? Hey, you big dumb idiot. I know it confused me at first, and I did um, see a couple LPs where the person playing didn't even 
realize it happened. They didn't even put two and two together that it was Julie. Oh, you sound tired. Hmm, I am. Are you having a nice time? Wonderful. Sure. Are you? Everything good there? Jules? What? Oh, sorry, Henry. Yeah, I'm good. Well, that's good. Well, I'll let you get back to sleep then. Mm, okay, Jules. Delilah seems nice. Mm-hmm, sure. Bye, baby. Yeah, some people didn't catch it. I know it confused me at first, but, you know, you should be able to catch on with the names. Should. All right, what do we got here? I like how you're not looking at an actual updated map when... Is it too much of a pain in the ass to bring supplies all the way up to our towers? Well, I get my stuff hand-delivered. Oh, how's that work? It's the perks of a decade of service. You're out hiking in 90-degree heat, and I get to do crosswords. Isn't life miserably unfair? Anyway, when you find the supply drop, remember it's not just for you, okay? Other lookouts, biologists, a few people get their food there, and... I don't want to have to call in for more. Right, right. There should be loads of good stuff, though. Beans, prunes, jerky. You know, my sister eats six prunes a day. Six. She's, like, really precise about it. She'd be great at this job if she didn't need wheelbarrows full of marijuana to function. <laughs> All right, cool. I think that's about it for this episode. We'll, um, go... Hey, so... Who's Jules? It's none of your business. I, I mean, I assume it's your ex. None of your business. Um, I'm gonna just let that one go. I, I don't mean to pry. Yes, yes. It's just, um... Anyways, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.